Yeah, hi everyone, and welcome to our No Java, No Problem webinar. We're uh, conducting this webinar live from Berlin, and it's 34 degrees here. So we are, we are sweating in this room, but we're excited to um, talk to you about uh, how can Windows plays with non-Java code. Uh, my name is Daya. I'm going to be your moderator for today. Uh, just a few items to go through before I pass on the torch. Uh, this webinar will be recorded which means that we will send you the webinar recording uh, via email in the next day or two, and it's also gonna be live on our website. And the other thing I wanted to share with you is that uh, we conduct these webinars so that you guys have an opportunity to ask a lot of questions. So how do you go about asking a question? There should be a question mark symbol on your uh, computer screen in front of you. If you click on that, type your question in, we will do our best to answer all of your questions at the end of this webinar. So we're not answering your questions, doesn't mean we're ignoring you. So with that being said, I'm gonna pass on uh, the torch to Niall and Mike, who are gonna be conducting this webinar. There we go. All right, this is Mike um, from Kamunda's marketing team, and I am joined today by Niall. I'm going to um, talk to you today about uh, some new features that came out in Kamunda 7.9, released in May, uh, external task clients in particular, to make it easier to connect uh, external workers to Kamunda's workflow engine. We're going to go in and give you a demo, also talk a bit about high-level concepts, you know, the way that you can think about these features. And I'm joined today by Niall. Uh, who's one of our technical consultants. His job is to travel the globe <laughs> and to help Kamunda customers uh, get Kamunda up and running, uh, ensure that they're um, using Kamunda according to best practices. He has a ton of hands-on experience and is really the per perfect person to join us today. So thank yeah, you, Yeah, no problem. So if anything goes correct, it's all thanks to me. If anything goes wrong, it is Mike's fault. That sounds like a plan. Yeah, and uh, of course, thank you, Daya, for the housekeeping. For yeah, the and we just wanted to say most of these details were, were already covered. Thank you very much, Daya, for the intro. Just wanted to say that much of what we're going to be demoing today is based on a new quick start guide that we pushed uh, the Kamunda docs, also with the 7.9 release. And so you can see the slides URL where to find uh, the quick start. And just about all the code that we're going to be using is publicly available. You don't need to even really write any code to be able to, to do this yourself. So we encourage you after the webinar to get hands on. I think that would be great. Um, and so, Hang on. One more housekeeping item. So we're running until next Monday, July 30th, uh, microservices orchestration survey. I think that a lot of you on this webinar might find the topic relevant. I'm um, going to be drawing names of a couple of respondents uh, as a token of appreciation, giveaway tickets, either KamundaCon in Berlin or Seton or Kamunda training. And so you can see a link to the survey on the slide. You can also find it on Twitter at Kamunda or on our blog. All right, now to get into the webinar. So. I mentioned in Kamunda 7.9, which we released at the end of May of this year, uh, we introduced new Java and Node.js task clients. And so um, it's a new feature for uh, connecting external workers to Kamunda's workflow engine. But I want to make a point that this external task pattern is not new, and it's something that we've supported quite a while. Um, the Kamunda REST API is one way that we've enabled this pattern, and we've long thought it was really important that a workflow engine should um, should integrate nicely with a broader architecture and should be able to integrate easily with with other applications. And um, so we already have you know, Thrust API. You know, why have these task clients as well? And so reason for that is that we're getting a lot of feedback. Hey, uh, it's, it's really helpful to use Kamunda for sort of emerging use cases like microservices orchestration. And we wanted to uh, make it easier to carry out those use cases. And these task clients are, are one way of doing that. And so what I want to look at before we really get into the details. It's a high-level process here. Uh, the example we're looking at is uh, you know, an e-commerce order fulfillment process. We have a series of service tasks, and each task is uh, carried out by an external worker, uh, each being a different microservice in a microservices orchestration case. And so, um, what we're going to talk to you more is talk to you more about today and, and show you uh, in a demo is how those external workers connect to the Kamunda workflow engine using these external task clients. And so, um, you know, again, very rele relevant for this microservices orchestration case, but for any other case where you have uh, external workers who need to participate in a workflow as well. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Niall, give us some background on the external task pattern, and then get into a demo and show you this uh, in real life. 
Awesome. Thank you very much uh, for that, Mike. That was fantastic. Uh, so yeah, I want to actually explain in more detail uh, what is actually happening. So what we'll be doing with the client, the external client, which will not be written in Java. In fact, you'll be lucky enough to say there'll be no Java, no Smelly Cat, no nothing in this whole thing. It'll be just JavaScript and BPMN and XML as a notation. So you're going to just see that, for instance, we're going to be very heavily using the concept of giving a service task a topic. The engine then will write that topic to an internal list of external tasks that, as you can see here, has the relevant topic. And essentially, then the engine just waits. The engine then is going to just say, well, I've done my job. I'm holding the state. And at some point, this is where we'll kick off something here. A worker that is uh, will be essentially polling for that work to do, and it'll end up um, being able to get that work, do it, and then tell the engine that they can continue. And as I said, the really big benefit here is the complete decoupling of the um, uh, the actual work, the business logic, to the actual orchestration that Kamun is really good at. So it means that while we will happen to be using JavaScript for this particular demo, um, it's actually possible to use whatever language you want, and in fact, even use multiple languages in a sort of polyglot system. So um, the clients themselves kind of work like this. They basically do this really simple thing where they have a thing they know uh, how to do. They know that by the name of a the topic. They will be using a, uh, a REST call called fetch and lock. This REST call will, uh, is actually wrapped around a, a JavaScript API that you'll see very shortly. So it won't be immediately visible. But this thing is actually doing most of the work. This tells the engine how many tasks it can grab at once. It'll tell the engine things like how long it wants to lock the task for and, of course, the topic itself. Itself. Once it actually has the lock, again, the engine maintains that lock for the time. The external task will handle that and then we'll send it back. For this demo, we're also going to add a whole bunch of other calls that happen at this point. So the happy path, of course, is that your external task grabs the work, does the work, and completes it. But that, of course, is not the only thing that happens. There's a whole bunch of other things that could go wrong. And so we'll maybe see what we can do about adding additional API calls to fix those. Okay. Um, everything I'm going to do right now is going to involve this lovely GitHub page. Uh, it might shock everyone to know that uh, despite the fact I'll be doing all this in JavaScript, my JavaScript knowledge is incredibly poor. I think the last framework I used was Precious Por Porcupine, which I don't even, I can't even remember when that was out. So, uh, it, so this, if you're not even into JavaScript, you can copy what I do and actually um, uh, uh, take that on board and just copy and paste and then watch me as I get along this. So you don't actually need JavaScript skills either. Okay. So now on to the demo. Okay, so um, I picked a relevant picture for this demo. And not People that I'm happily sitting around and watching something burn. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, obviously, I'm hoping that this demo doesn't turn into a, a little uh, log fire, but um, uh, don't worry, I have a, a list of people to blame if it does. Okay, so uh, let's uh, kick things off. So as I said, the very first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to start with uh, where we always do, which is uh, the Komodo modeler. Okay, um, I have come under running right now, but of course, the first thing I want to do is actually build a process and deploy it. Um, so let's do this. There we go. This is a modeler. I don't want to go into too much detail about the modeler. I think most people probably already know how it works. We can model BPMN from here. So here's my start event where we begin our process. We then have a task. Let's call this, um, let's say, um, uh, do uh, decide on on enjoyment of football. Okay, so this is our uh, first task. So we're going to ask you to tell uh, about the enjoyment of football, and um, we have an XOR gateway here, and it's going to be something like, um, "Do you love football?" Actually, you know what? We have two North Americans here, so. Let's let's be good about it. Thank you. Oh. That was <laughs> so. Now Mike knows knows what's I, going on. I'm with it now. I'm following along. Okay. <laughs> so this XR gateway is going to send one of two uh, possible um, uh, routes. So if we love soccer, we can go here, and if we don't love soccer, we can go here. So. Um, now, this is really obvious. I think we all know that any lover of football um, is very, very keen to watch um, uh, one of the better teams in North America's second division, I think, which is FC Cincinnati. Yes, that's correct. And how do I spell Cincinnati? C-I-N-C-I-N-N-A-T-I. Uh, A-T-I. -A -T -I. Wow, that is a 
very strange word. Okay, so that is, uh, let's say, watch uh, Cincinnati. Now, if you don't already love soccer, there is one team, of course, that will turn it around for you, and that is, of course, the greatest team in the German third division who wears green, which is Preußen Munster. The official team of Monday. And, exactly, and I'm pretty sure everyone knows these teams. I, I, there's, this, is, this is not a surprise to anybody. So the only thing I need to do now is I'm going to save this guy here to my desktop. I'm going to call it, um, let's say, Soccer Watch. Very stuff. And I'm going to give this a name. So I've done my design, and now the part I'm doing now is just configuring it a bit. So Soccer Watch and Soccer Watch. Okay, great stuff. And so now I just need to do some very basic stuff, and that is I'm going to add in here a well, let's actually change this a bit. Let's make this automated as well, just to make things more interesting. Okay, so this is going to be automated. So this is going to be a external task, and this is going to say uh, decide, or let's say uh, uh, football enjoyment. Okay, uh, that is the topic that will be in existence when we start this process. Um, next up, we actually need uh, to... Uh, configure these. So I expect this external task, which doesn't exist yet, to basically start up and then give us a good idea. Uh, it gives a variable that's going to let us route the process a little better. So this is going to be, um, let's say, uh, love football. Okay. And the other one is going to be the opposite. This, I assume, is not new to people. So um, uh, if you do have any specific questions about that, we'll put up some documentation later. But until then, I'm just going to say uh, external, and this is going to be um, watch sin, and this one's going to be oops, external watch uh, mun. Okay. So all of these now are external tasks, or in the sense that they don't really exist yet. The microservices aren't there, but they don't need to be there. The really important thing is that all we have is this XML. And the decoupling is complete. We basically say we have, as a process engine, have everything we need, which is that we have um, the orchestration parts of it kind of complete. So all I need to do is deploy here. Now, this I'm deploying via the REST API. For those wondering, it's this particular call here. Okay, it's common enough. The reason I can do this in this case is because usually if you're using Java, you tend to uh, attach a Java class, uh, which means you need to wrap it up in some kind of deployment, like an application or something, because you need the context to run the Java class. But because we have no other dependencies, we can actually start this really, really easily. Um, there we go. And uh, just using, just sending the, um, uh, the XML. So what should have happened is cockpit here should, if I refresh this, should have a shiny new um, process deployed. Um, and if not, it's almost certainly Mike's fault. Um, ah, there we go. Soccer watch is up and live. Okay, great stuff. So uh, the next phase in this is just starting it. Now, um, as I said before, you could start this um, via the UI in, in task list, but actually just to make things more interesting, I'm going to start it from here, and I'm just going to start this process um, using the REST API directly. And all I actually need is the soccer watch key, pop it in there, and then start it. So that's important because microservices can do more than just get and fetch work. Okay, they can also do really cool stuff like simply um, start instances of process, like tell the engine you need to do this work. And so that's quite useful. So then we can refresh our pay. Oh, that's the wrong refresh cockpit because that's where the instances are. And we should see a few instances that have started. Um, there we go. Okay, all makes sense so far. Now let's build ourselves some workers. Okay. So I have, uh, for those following along, uh, right now what you need is an empty folder. And uh, from that, we're going to go ahead and use, as I said, my very uh, awful knowledge of um, uh, JavaScript is going to try and uh, get me through this. So let's start with where I always do with any JavaScript question, which is Google. I'm say Commanda, uh, let's say JavaScript client. Okay, let's see what we get. And we are brought here. Okay, great stuff. So this is the repository for the actual client that we support. And um, this thing, um, it should be important to know, implements the REST API that Mike was talking about earlier. 
So all those calls that are made are simply wrapped up in um, this, and it can do loads of really cool stuff. And the very first thing I want to do is I'm going to grab this lovely guy here, and I'm going to um, do do do. I'm going to just uh, actually don't need that right now. First, I actually need the uh, the package itself. I happen to have npm, so I'm just going to kick off a little uh, PowerShell here, and I'm just going to say, okay, give me my client. So this is going to go ahead and download that from npm. So this is, of course, the the, the one dependency that we need for our uh, our JavaScript and um, uh, for our JavaScript uh, um, uh, worker. So that's done. So our folder now has two files. So it has a dependency, and now we just need the actual worker itself. So let's call this the decide. Uh, let's say let's say um, the sucker like .js. Okay, there we go. And let's open that up. So right now we have an empty file, and of course, because my favorite thing to do is copy other people's code, I see here that uh, our dear colleague Safe has very kindly added some code for me to copy. Thank you, Safe. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, we should have shout out for the guy to do all the real actual work. So, um, so um, there we have. Uh, so what's happening here is we have the required um, JS client. We also have uh, the REST endpoint because we need that to be able to know where we're going, and we also have the client subscribe uh, thing here. This is doing the fetch and lock essentially. If I give this a certain worker, it's going to fetch that worker and then complete it. So let's actually take a look at what would happen if I were to start this, just as it is. I actually already have a node client started, so I'm not sure why I did that. So let's go node and then um, soccer like that. Yes, boom, start it. And uh, that did nothing. That's fantastic because I did not save because Niall can copy code, but he can't save it. Okay, let's try that one more time. This time with meaning. Okay, there we go. Uh, okay, great stuff. Now you subscribed, and what's happening? Well, nothing of consequence is happening, um, which is a shame. It's polling, which um, is good, but it's not finding anything. And that makes sense because... I see a topic issue. <laughs> yes, there is a very, very important topic issue, which, of course, is that we have got nothing. I mean, credit scoring in soccer doesn't go together that well. So you may remember that I gave this thing the football enjoyment topic. And so if you actually look into cockpit itself, and I select one of these guys, okay, we'll be able to see that um, the external task here is saying, I'm waiting for this topic to come and get me. So let's really quickly add that additional uh, thing here. But also there's one more thing I need to add because getting it is not gonna be very helpful because I need to transverse this gateway. Um, so I actually need to set a variable as well. So let's head back to my stolen code repository and swing down to here, where, it, where we very kindly got a method of being able to uh, get variables. So I'm going to copy this. Whoops, let's go back. Oh, too far back. There we go. Do -do. So I'm going to actually use the example here to just copy the, uh, the variable thing there. I'm going to add that to my... Um, I'm going to add that to my, my worker. Okay, great stuff. And now I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to create a variable that I can pass to the engine to tell it stuff. Okay, so you see here it says put business logic. So I am not one to ignore um, code comments. So I'm going to put it right there. Um, he, he, yeah, Mike's laughing because he knows that <laughs> that is that may be a, maybe a bit of a fallacy. I wasn't going to say anything. <laughs> yeah. So. I'm going to put in here, love football is our variable, and it's going to be, uh, Mike, do you like football? Yes. Okay, there we go. And um, there, there we go. And we're, the next thing is we need to complete the task, but this time we're completing it with the process variables that we've created. So let's just add that. There we go. Okay, that's good so far. So now let's see what happens if I kick this off. Has Niall saved? He, Niall has saved. He's learning from his mistakes, everybody. Okay, so kick this off, and whoa, what happened there? So as we can quite quickly see, we have polled three tasks, and we've been able to complete them all. And actually, right now, we should be able to see that in Cockpit, they should have actually moved to the next um, thing here. There we go, alive and well. 
And we're all now going to watch uh, Cincinnati do their thing, which is always fun. Um, now, one thing people, I'm going to get to this right now. There's a whole bunch of features you can add. There's one I want to add straight away because I know people are really worried whenever they see this polling thing. Mm. Okay. That is, uh, that's clearly a problem in terms of resource consumption because you do not want to be hitting the server constantly with that sort of thing. Of so, polling, yeah. yeah. Now, this is what happens by default. It's a lot of polling and it's, it's kind of wasted. So what I want to do is I want to implement what we call long polling, okay? So um, if we take a look at the client options, there is a feature called async response timeout. That lovely uh, string of words actually kind of implements, uh, if added to the client, implements a very nice feature by which we can say to the engine, I want this topic and I want some work from there. Now, as we know, if we don't have this, essentially, sends back an empty list saying, sorry, no topic for you. Um, but in this case, I'm going to say, I would quite like a topic, but if you have none, I want you to keep this connection open until one shows up. Okay, so by adding this asynchronous timeout variable here and giving it some arbitrary amount here, save that, I can, now when I start up my client, something very interesting happens, which is polling. And we are polling and waiting because we are now holding this connection until, and if I just put that to the side briefly and let's open up Postman. So then I'm just going to send this request, I hope, again. And so now it completes it straight away because it gets it and it hasn't been wasted so much. So now what we've done is we've managed to essentially have this worker that is polling for um, uh, polling occasionally for new work, but the nice thing is it's not polling all the time. It just needs to stay open until needed. So that's actually a, quite a nice um, feature for asynchronous continuation. Um, super. So that's the very beginning of this little uh, demo. So let's, I think it is anyway. So let's actually talk about the actual features themselves um, and what we've done so far. Yeah, so let's see, we've, we've gotten through the third point there, yeah, extending the lock duration of uh tasks yeah. and so um so yeah let's uh let's let's talk about errors should we talk about errors next the errors are fun i mean mainly because they follow me around um so we've actually quite quickly implemented the fetch and lock and complete we've been able to add um asynchronous uh sorry we are at, at long polling and that's all the important stuff but it's also the stuff that is going to be sure the most common way to actually deal with external tasks because it's the happy path but there's some stuff in there that's quite interesting so for instance bpmn errors is an interesting one technical failures is an interesting one um being able to uh, get variables from the engine is kind of interesting too and do do something with them um there's also the ability and this is actually quite, something i quite like i think it's understated uh, when we actually lock a task um it's the engine expects us to do it and the problem is that if we then shut down that worker, let's say for a legitimate reason, we then are, that worker still technically locks that task. And so by enabling workers to unlock any tasks they have, we have a really nice uh, API in which people can actually have like really easy shutdowns of their microservices without actually needing to worry about work being uh, locked and take a little longer. Now, what I want to do with the time we have uh, is I want to, well, <laughs> I want to show you what happens when stuff goes wrong. So I'm going to spend some time on the bottom three there, which is BPMN errors, which um, another term for those would be business errors. Those are things like you want to go see Cincinnati play, but they're not playing that week. Okay, yeah. that is a, a shame. Yeah. It's a real shame. But it can happen. Yeah. <laughs> you need to fight for it. It's always a very sad day when that happens. Uh, then also technical failures, um, things like when you are trying to actually uh, – achieve something in your code, but your code actually fails. Um, so uh, we can see how that works. So um, let's put that, let's close that for a moment. So um, let's head back to our worker here. So the first thing I want to do is I want to um, add the possibility of uh, throwing a, a technical error, okay? Um, so we have our business logic here, and in on, under certain circumstances, uh, we want to throw a technical error for some reason. To make this demo a little easier, I'm going to do that based on a variable because why not? So um, I'm going to first get a variable from the engine, specifically ask for a variable. And to do that, you'll never guess where I'm going to go. I'm going to head back to say some of the examples and uh, I'm going to um, look for, there we go, variable stuff. 
So this is how we're going to get our variable. Okay, let's copy that and let's pop it in here. So if uh, let's say we're going to say um, let's say hate. Hate is a very strong term. Yeah. Let's, let's go with dislike. Um, soccer. Okay. If this is a variable. Um, Then we are going to check if it's true. So if we dislike soccer, then we are going to throw an error. Somehow we are going to throw an error. Any idea how we do that, Mike? <laughs> Trick question, of course, because I also am not really sure. So I'm going to go back. I know where you can find it. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so luckily up here we have handling failure. Okay, and you can see here that it basically does this. It basically um, uh, says, service, I want you to handle this failure, and then I give it back some failure message. So let's pop in here and just say, okay, handle failure, and then return. Okay, so this is gonna say, if the variable dislike soccer is true, we're basically gonna say, sorry, this is, this is not gone well. This is actually failed. So otherwise, though, we'll complete the task normally. Okay, um, this is actually a really important feature because it's a way of actually saying that it's a way of actually turning your microservice uh, architecture into a centralized point where you can actually see errors and things. Um, so let's uh, see if this works. I'm going to kick off my little worker. Okay, so it's polling slowly as we plan for it to do. And now I'm going to um, go back to my uh, thing here. And I'm going to add an additional variable, and that variable is predictably enough going to cause some problems. So wait, love football. Ooh, let's not go crazy. So let's add um, this guy here, a variable called uh, dislike soccer, and it's true. Sadly true. Yeah, sadly true. <laughs> Die a big soccer fan? No, sadly not. Okay, so uh, let's send that along. Okay, that, that's good news. Uh, how is our, oh, oh, look at this. Our, something terrible has happened in our, with our worker. Our worker, of course, has polled, got that one task, and, and has very kindly handled that failure, and has then gone back to polling. This is a really cool thing. So what happened was we actually failed, of course, but it didn't mean we brought down the whole microservice. The microservice was able to say, okay, we didn't, we were able to accomplish that particular incident, and how Commando deals with that is we have this, little guy here. So we've now been told this big X thing is telling us something is wrong. And we can see that this one here is particular, in particular mm -hmm. is wrong. And we can sort of say, okay, that's, that's not good. So there's a few ways of dealing with these errors. Um, so the first, uh, so first of all, this guy won't pick that up anymore. Mm -hmm. That's really important. Once it's in a state of error, the engine's like, well, well it's, this guy has legitimately told me it can't complete it, so I'm just gonna leave that happen. So what we can do is we can select the instance, okay? And I'm gonna demonstrate this. It, let's imagine there's like 20 of these, okay? So I'm going to just uh, change my variable here to uh, something else, false. I also kill it as well, if that would work, we'll see. And what I want to do is um, I want to restart it. I want to like tell the engine that we can actually go ahead and try that again, because now I'm pretty sure I'll fix the problem. Mm -hmm. um, now, usually this happens in a, in a bulk way. So if we go to batch operations, a really nice thing we can do is we can actually ask for uh, to set a retries for external tasks, okay? Because if you take a look back here, back in the wonderful world of um, Soccer Watch, this particular error has a very specific type. Uh, it's treated very differently with other types of errors. It's specifically, let's say incidents there, there it is. It's specifically a, a failed external task. Now I could just retry it here, but I wanna show you guys, um, it's very, very common that a whole bunch of these would fail at once. And it's important to know that we, we, we've thought of that and we basically can say, okay, well, give that one more try. So retry the external task. Then we can do something really cool where we can actually say, well, I only I want to do a quick filter for incident status is open. So only incidents that are open. There's only one there, but I can add more, of course. I can say only for incident type that is equal to 
fail its own task. And I can then say something like, and I'm only really interested in giving a retry to the guys I fixed, which are all part of the uh, process definition, definition key, uh, which is, if I can find it, software watch. Okay, there we go. So now I can just say, okay, set those retries back to one. There we go, an execute operation. We should see this got picked up and uh, got completed. Very good. Yeah, there we go, well, alive and well. Thank you very much. Yeah. I'm pretty great. So uh, the next thing I want to do is I want to actually um, create a shiny new worker. And this worker is going to do something wonderful. You're going to really like this. It's going to watch Cincinnati play some football. Uh, so um, let's let's do that now. So I'm going to um, head back to my empty thing here. I'm going to copy my like soccer JS. And this is uh, watch. OK, so firstly, I'm going to, uh, a lot of this is going to be the same. The big difference is that I actually um, want to add the uh, error I talked about earlier. So I want to have an additional feature, which is if, okay, um, this error happens, which is no uh, Cincinnati this week <laughs> or today, maybe. There's no game on today. Well, I want my worker to realize this and then go, okay, well, don't worry. We don't have to fail. We don't need to call an admin in to give us any retries. We can actually just, um, there we go, uh, do something else. So, of course, this has been all about uh, soccer and football or whatever that is called. But, of course, everyone knows that there is a much better sport out there. And it is called. Oh, I see what's coming. Yeah, you know it. Yeah. Watch rugby. Okay, so this would be a good cure for um, anyone who thinks football is a good sport. So um, we want this microservice to be able to, we already know that we can give ourselves a really nice technical error from here, that's fine, but in BPMN you have concepts where we have been asked to do something as a microservice and we can't do it. The first one that I demonstrated was a technical error where I can't do it because I failed because the code broke. The second one is actually a lot more interesting. The second one is you have asked me to do something, but I can't for a completely legitimate reason. But don't worry, you should be able to continue anyway, despite the fact I failed to achieve that. And it's it's really good because it means that we can plan for, let's say, edge cases or we can route the process differently based on certain types of failure of our microservice. So um, let's add uh, our error. So our error beacon message is no sim today. <laughs> today. Awesome. Okay, so um, that's all we need there. And so now I'm actually just going to redeploy this. Um, those of you who might have seen versioning before, um, there we go. who might have seen versioning work before, I'm not going to go into it, but basically right now uh, we should see that uh, we now have a new version uh, of our process and it is uh, right here. Okay, fantastic. And so I'm just going to migrate the old versions. So I'm going to migrate Cincinnati back over there. Okay. And let's see if that works. Okay, great stuff. In the meantime, I'm also going to do something a little more interesting. I'm going to um, change this to false. Okay, and I'm going to uh, save this. I'm just going to add this as a runner because that's kind of fun. And I'm just going to um, uh, save that to a collection. Collection will be called, um, let's say, okay, and then save to football. Great. So now I'm going to be able to just run this so I can start a whole bunch of instances. That'd be kind of fun. Um, doo -doo -doo. So what I'm doing actually, um, for those who don't use Postman, I'm basically cre um, I'm creating uh, a runner so I can run this REST call uh, multiple times. And um, let's just run it 100 times and let's have a 2,000 uh, thing. So let's run that. So hopefully this means that our worker here should be collecting tasks. That is very good. So it's collecting clean tasks. And assuming that I did it correctly, uh, it should also be sitting waiting for our Cincinnati. Um, 
uh, stuff to happen. So, yep, there we go. We got a whole bunch of them. So now let's uh, head back to our thing and let's um, delete this. We don't really need it. Um, oh, well, maybe. No, we don't need it. Um, so let's do that. So um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to throw a lot of errors. So what I want to do, yeah, we, we're going to get our little football thing. We don't need that either. There we go. So if I want to throw a BPMN error, okay, I need to go to to the, this guy right here. And you can see here, handle BPM error. And this is quite different because as I said, it's not showing a technical error. So I'm just going to say, this thing is basically, uh, since that he's not, not, not doing any checks, we're assuming it's the off season. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> and uh, let's take a look at the error. We need to throw is this one, no sim today. Great, let's have that. Uh, we also need to subscribe to a different topic, which is called uh, watching sin and let's add that okay and now we are going to um, save this I assume I've done things more or less correctly although I can never be entirely sure of that so um, only one way to find out yeah exactly let's just run it and see what broke uh, let's head back here node Oh, there we go. Whoa, look at all those errors. Ah, so many errors. Okay, so, so much is going wrong, but like, you know, it's not so bad. So it's it's basically gotten these and handled them in a really interesting way. So it's handled these men error, which means that all of those processes that have started, which is quite a few of them, I think, are going to be rooted up. Mm -hmm. If it loads, which I presume it will. Yeah, see, I always thought my JavaScript was a problem. It's going quite quickly now, so let's see. Wow, so Cincinnati, popular spot. So what we can see here is, let's actually kill this uh, worker for a second. Uh, where's our sin worker? Probably this one. Okay, and let's, uh, yep. So now what's happening is this is starting and it's then completing that task. It's waiting here at Cincinnati and then that is saying, oh, something bad happened, but don't worry, you get to watch rugby. Yeah, and we planned for it and, yeah, exactly. and accounted for it, so it's okay. It, so this is actually, uh, I would consider this to be uh, a perfectly reasonable thing to happen. The admin is not the kind of person you want to see checking these error events. It's not that important to them. These are legitimate uh, um, parts of uh, the Beefman building blocks that allow us to essentially um, uh, keep uh, processes running even if something unexpected or unwanted happens. And I want to point out, as you've been um, working through this demo, you've been sort of creating and modifying the worker services um, without having to really do anything with the engine. You have to have sort of connection points, of course, like Topic, yeah. for instance, so that the um, the engine and the worker can communicate with one another, but able to make changes and deploy independently of anything going on in the worker, which is really nice and adheres to a microservices principle of this idea of loose coupling. So. Exactly right. In fact, um, that's a really good point. But um, as well, yeah, it's true. It's actually kind of handy to be able to just change these and swap them in and out. While at the same time, my runner is building stuff, which is just stop. Let's make him do more stuff. Let's start up our thing again. That's working hard. Let's see if Cincinnati can get back to work. There we go. No more errors for you. Oh, cool. All right. So, um, yeah, you're right. So that's um, the, the thing is I can change my workers really, really quickly. And my process, importantly, as you mentioned, doesn't need to know about any of those changes. The process itself is completely independent. In fact, I even changed the process a few times and it didn't matter. So for instance, if I decided I want to make sure that, um, let's say, let's make another change to the process. Let's um, add just a parallel gateway here. That's just to show the kind of fun stuff we can do. I mean, fun stuff is relative, but I mean, for me, this is, this is fun stuff. Um, and let's uh, just make things a little more interesting. Let's have uh, two of these running at the same time. So enjoying the football, just running twice, why not? Um, okay, good stuff. And uh, let's save that and just, uh, so right now, as you know, we're sitting our worker, we're completing, we're about 31% through. And that call that we make to start the process is also, as I said, independent of the engine. So it means that we can now, um, here we go, ooh, 85, where is that stuck? Um, 
Oh yeah, probably a month through. So now we can see that a whole bunch of these now coming through and uh, that's the new version, but also the old version is still clocking away at stuff because it can run in parallel. So it's actually, um, it's actually quite a nice, um, nice addition. Another thing that is actually hard to do in um, the Java world, well, the, in the world where you would attach Java classes, is the idea of scaling. So right now I've added a bunch of extra stuff here. And in fact, I'm even going to go ahead and like make this even more complicated. I'm going to add, um, um, let's say another thousand, but I'm going to make this a little faster. So make this runner. I wanted to create, um, I wanted to create tasks faster than I can complete them. Okay, so our worker here is doing its darndest. It's throwing all sorts of errors for various reasons. Um, and, and the nice thing is we can actually scale that up and actually add a whole bunch of other workers that can also do the same thing. So if you need to scale up, you can do that. It's actually pretty cool. Yeah, very nice. Yeah. Okay, so um, there's also, those of you, uh, let's return here for a moment. Um, to do. There uh, is also another thing that um, I know this. This well, we we made promises of no Java. We didn't so, promise no Java. We just promised an example with no Java as well. <laughs> so I think it's okay. Okay, go good. Back. So no one yeah. gets too angry. Yeah. Uh, what I've done so far is I've used almost entirely uh, JavaScript, as we saw, uh, a lot of copy paste to make this worker. Now, just because we happen to use the external task pattern. You can also use Java, of course, because we also have a client written in Java that works in exactly the same way. It's totally decoupled from the engine. It can be added as a Maven dependency uh, really easily, along with the logger. And then you can basically get the same results. So you can see here that we have the implementation here. It works in exactly the same way. And uh, it's also, if we take a look at it, let's say, um, um, Tamunda Java client. Um, do to do, there it is. Okay, so this guy here is been built, and again, we have uh, some good documentation. So, um, everything I've done so far, I essentially followed this lovely thing here. Um, this is the um, a uh, quick start guide that I've essentially gone through kind of uh, without your knowledge. So sorry about that, I only feel tricked. But the idea is that we can actually download and install the engine, execute a process and deploy it. If we follow this particular link here, it shows how we can create a process. So this is getting the modeler, adding the bits and pieces that I talked about, um, and also um, configuring the task correctly. And of course, the important thing is at some stage, this um, diverges. You can see here implementing an external task worker. You can do one or the other or both, of course, if you decide to swap one out for another. Um, and it should be quite straightforward. So if I click on the Java implementation, I can see that I'm being given details about how I can use Eclipse or, I mean, in fairness, you can use any IDE you like to create a, um, uh, a new um, project and then add all the requirements here to make the, uh, the worker run in exactly the same way and just start up um, uh, the worker. And as you can see, it looks really similar. We need the base URL. We need to subscribe to a specific topic. We have lock duration. And then we just open that and, it's, and it runs. So um, the concepts are the same in both workers. And that is entirely down to the fact that, of course, we have, um, uh, we have a REST API that's actually dealing with that um, uh, in the background. Because as Mike said in the, in, in the beginning, this is not a new feature in terms of uh, functionality, although we have added some stuff to it. Um, but it comes from, if we go to docs.comona.org, all of this is built on top of, um, in the reference here. We actually had a question come in about the REST API, and so I'm glad that you're oh, wow, taking really? us there. Yeah, this is one of the things that I wanted to be sure to, uh, to look at together. Ah, great, okay. So we have here the external task REST API. Now, everything you've seen today is built on this. Um, and let me just kill the workers before Node.js eats up everything. Okay, there we go. So um, the external tasks um, essentially uh, implement, there is the fetch and lock, okay? So if we look into that, I'm gonna open this up. This is probably the most important call that the, the worker makes. And I'm gonna go right down to the example. So here's what the worker was doing. It was fetching and locking. It gave the engine a worker ID. It then, uh, told it how many tasks they wanted, and then it also told it, very importantly, the topics it could 
subscribe to, as well as how long it's needed and some variables and stuff. This is the rest call that happens behind the scenes. And this can be implemented any way you like. Uh, the other uh, call we made, of course, was complete. Uh, this is an important look at purely on the way it completes because it has this important thing here. Um, to avoid sort of uh, a bit of a mix up between workers, we have this very simple concept that says if a worker locks a task, that same worker must complete it. And usually when you complete, uh, when you lock a task, you must give it uh, an external uh, a worker ID to let you know who you are. And that's the only worker that's allowed to do that. Um, so then we have uh, the handle, handle beef men error, which again, I just went through using priest for the easiest call there is. And there's a few others that I haven't actually talked about. And um, the first one was unlock, which is important. And uh, if you're interested in actually just finding out what's happening in your, uh, in your, with your external tasks, uh, purely, uh, this is a really great actually uh, uh, call to make. Uh, very often these external tasks are dynamically scalable, okay? But how do you know if you should scale up or not? Uh, it's really cool. You can basically uh, have um, an automated service that um, looks up Let's say, let's create a new little thing here. So this is a get, we'll just copy most of this. Um, I'm going to pop this here. So get, and then I'm going to just use external tasks. And the thing is we can find out what external tasks are currently there. So we could do something like uh, add, um, there's none apparently. So if there was some, we would get like some external tasks and then we can get a count as well, I assume. There we go get list count, and we can automate a way by which if we have a certain number of workers, let's say there's like 20 uh, or 300 that need to be done, like say a threshold, then you can actually programmatically scale up those workers because you can have lots of workers working on the same topic at the same time. So there's a lot more to, 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 to these workers. Um, I haven't even talked about priority yet as well, which is really important because certain, obviously seeing um, uh, watching rugby and seeing Cincinnati is very different on the priority list, depending on who you are. Uh, so you can use priority as well to um, to uh, ensure that the workers actually get the right tasks. Very good. So we've had a few questions come in. We're going to get to those in a moment. Uh, but before we do that, I want to put you on the spot a bit yeah, and perfect. ask you a question. And, I love questions. Uh, yeah. So I want to say, say there's someone here on the webinar. Uh, they're going to be uh, implementing external workers for the first time. This external task pattern. Yeah. You know, new to this idea. What What are some you know, based on your experience in the field, some things to look out for, be aware of when, when planning this? Yeah. So I think the first thing was the idea that the engine does not call the worker itself can sometimes be a bit of a a bit of a weird thing to do because usually what we do is we would have the Java class attached to this. So usually I would have this guy here in a Java class and some class, okay? And it would be the class itself that would that would ping the worker. So a very common question I get is like, yeah, these workers are great, but actually I would like my worker to be told to do work uh, by the engine. And this actually uh, kind of gets to complications because then we have, uh, it creates a really annoying dependency because then I need to know where this worker is. Then uh, if we have multiple workers, I need to make sure I can hit a load balancer that then finds the right worker. It, it By using, by just getting behind the idea of saying, yes, polling can sometimes be a bit off-putting, but you need to get past that. The, um, I think the last time I was doing that, someone tried to make workers, but they they basically couldn't get past the idea of this polling being a big problem. So I need to, I would say, get over that first, and then building it is actually quite straightforward um, because um, everything here, and especially the community, is really big on using these. Um, and uh, another another thing that I always get asked about as well when building these workers, and again, it's a misnomer, fetch and lock has a bunch of parameters that are here that you can see. And one of those parameters is not the name of the process definition or the name of the, uh, of the name of the business key or nothing like that. This is another concept you need to get your head around. If I have a task and it's called enjoy football, football enjoyment, it means that I should be able to give this to any process so any process can have this task anywhere distributed throughout the entire um, process landscape, and it will always do the same thing. And it w doesn't matter that enjoy fo jo uh, football enjoyment happens to be here or in some other thing. The reason we do not ask 
or do not require or don't actually want to know about the process definition is because you need to think of these microservices as being irrelevant as to who calls them. The only relevance is the person who calls them knows what to expect back. Very clear. Thank you. Super. All right. So let's get to some of the questions that have come in. Um, slide for that. Let me just get that up. Yes, perfect. Yeah. Excellent. So we'll get through as many of these as we can. We're right on time. Thank you for that, Niall. Excellent job. Uh, so we had a question. Can a worker be started in response to an event, um, you know, something being provided by the engine? Um, I mean, theoretically, yeah, because the um, any time, so we have something called the history event stream, uh, which means that anything that happens in the engine go to this, this event stream. And uh, the event stream contains anything that would uh, save something to the database from state. And uh, if you wanted to, you could actually uh, uh, you write a composite class that is attached to the history event stream that essentially looks for uh, this. I think that's overcomplicating things mm -hmm. because it meant then if you needed to create a new uh, worker or whatever, you would then need to somehow uh, change this little plugin for the engine. I think that it's possible, but I wouldn't do it. I like the idea that workers can go up or down irrelevant to the engine and the engine can produce things. I think it's better just to say, uh, uh, a certain system manages their workers, they will keep them up or not, rather than starting them on a needs and on a, on a needs basis. Okay, great. So our next question is how we access logs so we see what's going on with external tasks. Mm. So we do have an external task log. I didn't actually show it there in Kafka, but it will tell you stuff like, um, it'll give you a timestamp on when, the, when it was um, added. It'll tell you who locked it, what external task locked it. It'll tell you um, what, uh, which, who completed it successfully and that sort of thing. Um, that's all part of the engine. Uh, it's all part of the, uh, kept in the database, in the history tables as far as I'm aware. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but I, but of course, each um, that's the stuff that you literally give the engine to work on. There's also a whole other set of logs that mm -hmm. the um, that the external task itself uh, produces, and that of course is kept away from the engine. That's stuff about uh, how it's um, how its polling is getting on, whatever happened internally, what sort of stuff is found. So you can have sort of two steps. Okay, makes sense. Yeah. So another question is, um, can you make a REST API call authentication free, or does an external worker need a username and password and other credentials? Oh, that's a good question. So the, the answer is it should have some sort of uh, authentication. Uh, uh, one thing I didn't show is, of course, the, authentic the authentication because it's way more work to set it up. Um, but yeah, I would say that um, having the API open like that would leave you open to some serious amount of danger. So yeah, no, I would say that having authentication as part of your REST calls should be should be something you do, although as I demonstrated, it is not a requirement. Um, so for instance, if you were losing a closed system in some way and actually you felt that the system itself was totally secure and that everything was going to be able to communicate within its own ecosystem, then I'm sure it's fine and make things easier. But usually those REST calls should have authentication built with, uh, well, the, all those REST calls that we saw has the ability to be sent with authentication. So yeah, no, I would suggest that's a good idea to, to uh, add that to your worker, but um, it's not necessarily required. Okay, sounds good. Just a moment, check for some questions. So uh, I have a question for you that I think it came up maybe the, uh, another time I saw you give this demo at a, at a meetup, and, and that question is how um, how these external task clients of this pattern might fit in with a, a messaging system like a Kafka, for example, and mm. how you might think about think about those two things as working together. So actually, we've seen some user demos where users tell us what they're doing, and they're using Kamunda with Kafka uh, to carry out this sort of a uh, this sort of work, but. Um, yeah, so that is, uh, thanks for that incredibly complicated question there, Mike. That's really your, your real pal. Um, so Kafka and Kamunda do actually work quite well together. And actually, external tasks, from, to my mind, is a really good way of doing it, um, mainly because um, with Kafka, you have the uh, um, underlying problem that Kafka is um, non-transactional and Kamunda is transactional. So you can sometimes get, uh, and Kafka is super fast as well. So you can sometimes get this messaging going back and forth. And so I've seen people implement uh, Commander integration with Kafka through Commander's own messaging system. But actually, external tasks are way better because external tasks can have this um, 
a very, very precise way of being able to um, communicate with Kafka. So the external task itself could actually be subscribing to a Kamunda a topic while at the same time then subscribing to or or creating topics in Kafka. So um, I quite like that. I quite like the idea of decoupling it that way. Mm-hmm. Um, but I've actually never cro- come across a um, um, uh, integration with Kafka that I'm 100% happy with yet. Okay. Uh, not in production anyway. This because um, it's it's uh, we got a lot of new stuff in Commanda and lots of people are starting to use Kafka with it. People are trying all sorts of different things. We don't really have a best case scenario there because there's so many different use cases. Some people use Kafka with absolutely like minimal throughput, which mm-hmm. means that it actually doesn't matter uh, mm-hmm. too much mm-hmm. about um, that. But um. Uh, and for those who have big throughput, then you need to wonder how is this going to work when Kafka is doing all sorts of stuff and Commander reaches a, um, a a barrier in scalability or something, for instance. Okay. So another question, um, I think I can take this one, is if there's a full example somewhere with a sample HTML UI and so on, I assume that means for um, for the uh, external worker service, um, for instance, maybe you can interact with it that way. And I don't think we have a an example like that yet, but I I can say that you know I, I went through the uh, the quick start we just um, that we just looked at in the documentation on my first day at Camundo when I didn't really know anything and was able to get uh, from start to finish in you know about an hour or so and it uh, made it much easier to sort of my head around these concepts. So I think that it's uh, um, at least a good starting point. This is an interesting idea, something we can provide be a bit more complete and demonstrating the power of these features. So, right. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, thanks a lot for uh, those questions and the um, uh, wonderful uh, names that you guys have come with, Fartboy especially. And um, uh, hopefully now we'll pass it back to our good friend, Daya. Thank you, Daya. Thank you, Daya. And uh, thanks, everybody, for um, for watching. Hope it was useful. I hope you guys learned an awful lot about copy-paste. And uh, yeah, Daya, take it away. Cool. Thanks so much, Niall and Mike, for a splendid presentation. Um, yeah, just one last note from my side. Uh, we couldn't answer all of your questions, so please feel free to post them in the forum. So it's the website is forum.comuna.org, and uh, I'm sure someone from our team will be able to answer those. And uh, thank you so much for joining us for the last hour and giving us your time. We really appreciated it. And uh, last but not least, we will send you the recording in the next day or two, and it's also going to be live on our website. So you can listen to this again. You can share it with your colleagues or your friends or your family. Um, (laughs) Anyways, we hope you have a great day and uh, speak to you guys soon.